Friday, we'll have 15 minutes for us to present the case. The appellant may retain the five minutes for rebuttal. If you're the appellant and you wish to retain some of that time, let me know when you come up to the podium. I'll keep you track of the clock and we'll keep you prized and passage of time. We are being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so please try to remain behind the podium as much as possible. Uh, we have read the briefs and we're ready to proceed with the argument. reserve uh, three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Right. Um, this case uh, involves, obviously involves a zoning issue. Um, I think it's important to um, reflect on the, uh, the nature of the property involved. Um, this uh, development, we'll call it, um, existed or exists on uh, West Market Street in Akron. The two front parcels are zoned commercial and they front uh, West Market Street. Um, there are two back parcels which are zoned single-family residential, and those parcels are essentially where the issue uh, is in this case. Um, the trial court, in my opinion, did not um, properly frame the complaint that was filed in this case. Um, the complaint has um, three separate counts, uh, count one, um, even though it has a lot of uh, assertions, statements of fact that were even included in the, in the preceding uh, administrative appeal, um, they don't go to the heart of the, of the cause of action in the first count. The first count has to do with whether the, uh, so we'll call it zoning statute, because or ordinance which is what it actually became, um, was invalid as it established to the extent that it established a, uh, a alley on a, a public alley on um, parcels that are zoned single family residential. And that's, that's essentially the relief that, that we're, is being asserted in count one. And count one is based on revised code section, a general law 713.13, which is also characterized by the Ohio Supreme Court many times as a special statute. It's more specific than a, the statute concerning a, an appeal from an administrative decision. This is no longer an administrative decision appeal. This has to do with an ordinance that was enacted by the city of Akron, which um, contains um, provisions that are invalid. It's invalid because there is no um, basis for the city of Akron to simply enact an ordinance, even if, even if it came by way of administrative action alleged administrative action, I'll get that in a second, um, to create a public alley, dedicated public alley, on parcels that are zoned single-family residential. How does, how does count two in the second complaint differ from count, I mean count one in the second complaint, differ from what was complained about in the first complaint? How do they differ? How does it differ from the administrative appeal? From the first time, the first complaint that was filed. Well, the first, the, well, first of all, um, the, the, the first complaint that, that was filed is a nullity. The, the court had no jurisdiction over that. It was no different than someone filing a complaint that was two days late. Okay, it, it, it was thrown out based on the statute of limitations. The court had no jurisdiction. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time concerning race judicata because if you look at the black letter law on race judicata, it's not there. And I think that was one of the things that um, uh, former Judge Belfast was reflecting on in her decision. Um, I don't agree with parts of the decision, but it is what it is. Um, it, it, this is a, this, this uh, count one specifically pertains to now what is an ordinance, not an administrative decision, but an ordinance. There's no um, issue concerning the, um, the procedure of, of adopting this ordinance, of enacting this ordinance. The issue is, is the ordinance lawful? And that's where revised code section 713.13 comes into effect. And you had two parties in the second lawsuit that were not even in, or in any way, shape, or form involved in administrative appeal. And the courts are very clear. And I'm saying, when I say courts, I'm saying the Ohio Supreme Court was very clear in Johnson versus United Enterprises that there are different options for contesting the validity of an ordinance. And this is that case. And the, the, um, you know, the 
trial court simply glossed over the fact of what relief was actually being asserted uh, in count one of the complaint. And that is, is, is the ordinance valid um, to the extent that it creates a public alley on property that's still a single family residential? Now, the vehicle for the city of Akron to get to that point was the conditional use process. Um, and, I, and I just want to say real very quickly here, an administrative body can act, um, can create administrative action based on existing law. But when you are uh, cre enacting a, and that's what they're limited to. In this case, there was no existing law that allowed them to create a public alley on, on property, so a single family residential. The only way they could get from point A to point B would be to change the zoning. And that's a completely different process than the conditional use process. So the issue in count one is, is the, is the statute valid, um, the ordinance I should say, is it valid to the extent that it creates this alley? And the answer to that question is no. Well, the trial court never got to that issue. Um, and it's clear that the trial court completely ignored the Ohio Supreme Court cases that, that say that um, there's different options for people to contest the validity, the lawfulness of a statute, the constitutionality of a statute. Forget the procedure. Is, is it a valid ordinance? The answer to this question is no, it's not. You can't create a public alley on property that's shown as single family residential um, unless you go through the zoning process. Um, that's the law. So with respect to count one, um, you know, the, the court is, the trial court obviously is going to some instruction on this. It needs to be remanded um, based on the fact that it didn't consider the law appropriately, it did not consider appropriately the relief that was being sought in the complaint. Now, in, with respect to counts two and three, there's no race judicata on, on any of those counts, but let's go to count, count two itself. Count two uh, pertains to the process that if someone has private property and they want to dedicate a public alley, that's the process they have to go through. And the process they have to go through is under um, 72309, general laws. Okay, and again, you know, the city of Akron can't bypass general laws um, and um, create an alley because it wants an alley somewhere. They have, they, they have to, and even if, let's say that the, the, an alley is created, okay, let's say the whole process is, is proper. The, the statutes under 72309, um, 72310, and 72311, they provide the, the procedure that would, would allow, so let's say it's approved, you can put an alley in. The person that's been approved to put an alley in still has to file a petition. The petition with the Common Pleas Court then allows the people that are affected by that alley to present damages before a jury they're permitted to have a jury trial considering how they're affected by that alley. Um, they can make their claims for relief, diminution of property value, and that type of thing. That's, the, that's what is claimed in count two, okay? Let's assume that it was a lawful ordinance now. Um, it doesn't foreclose the requirement that the property owner that seeks to create a public alley on private property to go through this process to give the people that are affected by that, um, or by that, let's say ordinance or um, conditional use, which is not, you know, there's nothing under the conditional use statute that allows um, the city to, to create a public alley for private property. It's not there. So it, that in itself makes it an un unlawful ordinance, but the statutes under 723.09 at SEC, they, they provide a basis for a party to receive money damages if they're affected by that private alley. That's count two. That can't even be brought up in an administrative appeal. It's not even within the scope of an administrative appeal. And I can stand up here all day and lecture on uh, administrative appeals and what's, what's, what can be brought in administrative appeals, but um, you know, there's no, you know, the trial court took issue with, well, there was no claim for damages. It was a claim for declaratory relief, okay? A pronouncement in order to say, this is what Mr. Niemer and, and Lebo Holdings needed to do if they were going to create a public alley, um, approved to put a public alley on, on property that's own, um, on private property. I mean, I don't think they, they're permitted to put a public alley on single family zoned property to begin with. I think they should have gone through the zoning process to, to do that. Uh, 
they would have we've been required to seek a zoning variance, not a conditional use permit. But this provides the relief. Um, it, it's a, we want a declaration that this was the procedure that they should have followed. It wasn't a it wasn't a cause of action for money damages. Um, it was a it was a, a uh, we wanted seeking a declaration order from the court that this is the process that they needed to file. And then assuming that we prevailed on that, Manning, Niebuhr, and Legal Holdings would have been re required to file a petition to the Common Pleas Court. Um, the uh, the uh, contiguous, the adjacent property owners would be permitted to then um, respond to that position and they would have been uh, permitted to present damages um, related to the creation of that alley. And Council, okay, when, let's, when, when, Council, when I'm hearing these arguments, though, it just seems like, um, I'm not saying it is, but it seems like it's just a backdoor approach to try to attack, attack the actual ordinance. It's, um, you know, it's procedure, that improper procedure. Well, let me just say that a, a you might call it a backdoor. It's 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 the law. You know the law provides um, different remedies for people that um, are subject to what what a, a, what appears to be or what is a unlawful ordinance. I mean, there's different remedies or different uh, ways to proceed against that. But in a, a appeal of an administrative decision, and, and this is you know I, I didn't want to do this, but I'm going to. Um, the, the Ohio Supreme Court, I don't know, how much time do I have left? You have one minute before you I, I have one minute. Stop. I'm going to, in response to that, I'm going to read the syllabus in the Supreme Court case Johnson versus United Enterprises, which basically says that Section 71313 is a special statute applying only to a situa situation where a claim is made that a building or structure is being erected, constructed, altered, repaired, or maintained, or land is being used in violation of the zoning ordinance. Zoning ordinance is single family dwelling um, zoning for that property. Um, and it, it's inclusive of, and this is it, they're acting in violation of um, Article 18, Section 3 of the Ohio Constitution. They're going beyond what, what powers they have as a municipality. It's a, it's a constitutional violation. It's a violation of their own zoning statutes. But um, it says specifically that, that any person coming within the terms of Section 71313, which means a person can bring this action, they even contested that, uh, may avail himself of this provision, even though he may have other remedies. I mean, that, this goes back to the 50s. And this, this case has not been overruled. Um, so 71313 provides the vehicle, and you have to focus on the fact that in an administrative appeal, and I have all kinds of issues with the, with the administrative decision on this case, that's an appeal of administrative decision. It's an appeal of an administrative body acting on existing law. The problem here was they didn't have existing law that they were acting on. But, but the point is now that it's an ordinance. The city of Akron adopted an ordinance because the city of Akron wanted an alley. I exceeded my time. You have a total of two minutes left. Oh, I'm going to reserve the last two minutes then. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Claire Dickinson. I'm here on behalf of Appley, the city of Akron. Uh, and I'm going to use at max five minutes of our share of time. Uh, this is Highland's fourth lawsuit uh, growing out of a conditional use that the city of Akron uh, adopted allowed five years ago. Highland, and it's uh, the uh, Miss Denerfields and the uh, Legion's second lawsuit. Uh, the uh, Highland uh, appeared at the uh, uh, hearing on the conditional use uh, and attempted to appeal that, but failed to properly appeal. Uh, everything that has happened since then has been to uh, use uh, Judge Carr's terminology, backdoor attempt to raise procedural matters that should have been raised in the appeal of that administrative proceeding that Highland failed to properly perfect. Uh, the, that administrative proceeding is raised judicata to everything that's happened. Since then, this court correctly recognized that the last time we were here uh, in an attempt to attack uh, the uh, uh, conditional use that the city granted. The 
Count one of the plaintiff's complaint in this case uh, is an attempt, uh, is, is a procedural attack uh, on the, the conditional use. Uh, count two is a procedural attack on the conditional use, both of which should have been taken care of in that administrative proceeding. The trial court correctly uh, granted the city summary judgment on count one and count two based upon race judicata. Count three, uh, the uh, trial court granted our motion to dismiss uh, that uh, count. Uh, and one of our arguments in support of the motion to dismiss was that uh, injunctive relief was not a proper vehicle uh, to uh, attempt to get Count three, I, I think, is an attempt to force the city to uh, in, enforce the conditions of the conditional use. One of our arguments was that's not a proper way, injunctive relief is not a proper way to get the city to do that. The proper way is th through a, 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 a mandamus action. The trial court agreed with us as an alternative basis for granting the motion to dismiss that the proper method is not injunctive relief, but a writ of mandamus. Her other reason for granting the motion to dismiss was that the uh, uh, elements of injunctive relief weren't properly alleged, uh, but, and, and Mr. Lennon has attacked that primary per reason for granting the motion to dismiss, but he hasn't attacked the, the secondary reason that mandamus. Uh, therefore, even if the trial court made a mistake uh, on the elements of injunction, saying that that was a reason for granting the, the uh, motion to dismiss, that would be harmless error because the alternative reason is on attack. So, uh, based upon that, I ask the, the court to affirm the trial court's grant of summary judgment on count one and two and dismissal of count three against the city. Thank you. May it please the court. My name is Jim Henshaw. I am here on behalf of Level Holdings LLC and Manuel Neal. The plaintiffs are arguing in this appeal that res judicata does not apply because the prior dismissal was not on the merits. This court ruled that the dismissal of an administrative appeal outside the time for perfecting the appeal is essentially a dismissal on the merits. So we believe that the appellants in this case are trying to relitigate the exact issues that this court has already ruled on and are asserting the exact same issues against my client in this present case that were previously asserted in the 2013 case. Um, now, count, one's in, count one and two, we believe res judicata applies because um, it applies to uh, the appellant, uh, the appellants and those in privity of those who could have been joined. And clearly the record shows that that is the case here uh, and that applies to the appellants. So we, we believe that res judicata clearly is appropriate and the trial court properly granted the dismissal of counts one and two based on res judicata. As to count three, attorney Lennon used a couple terms this morning that caught my attention. He said uh, the trial court did not properly frame the complaint, I believe is what the term was that he used. Um, count three, the appellant in this case framed it that, that there was, uh, that my clients have not followed the conditional use because they have not placed the garbage dumpster in a proper place, they didn't do proper brick work, didn't do sidewalk uh, work, etc. There was no mention of anything about the alleyway in count three. But what did we learn uh, this morning is that, to use Attorney Lennon's other phrase, the heart of the cause of action of the plaintiff we learn now is about the alleyway. And the alleyway was included in the 
2013 filing. That was appealed, and this court did not, uh, and granted res judicata based on this court. They did not decide to appeal that issue, apparently, on the alleyway. So we believe res judicata applies to what is really the, the heart of what their claim is now is the statutory injunctive relief pursuant to 713.13 as it applies to that alleyway. That is res judicata, it's just an attempt to relitigate the same issues in the 2013 case. And if you read paragraph 56 of the 2013 complaint, it reads almost verbatim as paragraph uh, 10 of the current uh, case uh, in front of the court. Uh, so we believe that this court has already uh, dismissed with prejudice uh, the, the causes of action that are presently before the court. And we ask that the court affirm the trial court's dismissal based on res judicata and the failure to state a cause of action in count three because there is no allegation of any damages uh, in count three or in the complaint, however the court wants to try and frame it. So we ask that, that the court affirm the trial court's granting of uh, dismissal in this case. And I would also like to point out to the court that we have raised the issue of the uh, mootness doctrine applying as well presently because the my client's buildings are built and occupied and they are ongoing businesses based under the mootness doctrine. So we believe that also applies. And we are asking this court to stop the continued attempts by the uh, appellants in this case to relitigate the issues that have already been determined by this court. And we ask that the, this court affirm the trial court's decision. Thank you. Thank you. Attorney Lemon, you have just over two minutes, sir. Thank you. All right, the city of Akron completely ignores uh, Karchus for City for Cincinnati, House Supreme Court case, um, which specifically states that um, the constitutionality of a zoning ordinance can be pursued both through declaratory judgment action, even if administrative appeal has also been pursued. Um, the city of Akron has not properly characterized, nor did the trial court properly characterize count two. Count two is for a process for claiming damages when somebody creates a public alley on, on private property. Pure and simple, those are general laws. Um, it, the, to the extent that the city of Akron um, creates this ordinance, creating this, this alley um, is in conflict with, um, with those general laws, it's unconstitutional. Um, you can't, once again, you can't claim money damages or even that you have been damaged in an administrative appeal. It, it, it's not possible. Um, so the argument that that was part of the administrative appeal is, is nonsensical. Um, count three is basically asserting that, the, that Manning Emer and, and Levo Holding, they haven't followed the conditions of the conditional use um, permit. Um, if you, we didn't reach this point in the trial court, but if you look at a picture of what they submitted to the city and what they showed the public, the building doesn't look anything like that. It's got, the front of it looks like a loading dock, the side of it looks like a warehouse. None of the exterior elements are, are the same as what was depicted in the picture. And the issue is, did they follow the, what they were granted? Assuming it's, a, it's, it's an okay law, assuming it's a proper law, did they follow what they were granted under the conditional use permit? And the answer is no. You look at the picture, it's not going to take long to decide. No, they didn't follow it. So that's what count three is. Now, maybe it's not properly, excuse me, properly pled against the, the city of Akron saying, uh, you know, uh, seeking uh, mandamus. But it is properly pled against the, the Nemo organization that they did not, they did not construct this building as they depicted, as they showed the city of Akron and as they showed the general public. Let me just say something really interesting here. When Mr. Nemo applied for a conditional use permit, it said nothing about an alley. It didn't say anything about the two um, parcels that are zoned single family residential. 
What this is is the city of Akron deciding that they wanted an alley. They wanted an alley here because they had already decided to close off the um, north exit from the Chipotle parking lot. Put a, a uh, they closed it off and put a uh, what do you call it? A cul-de-sac in. You couldn't get out there anymore. The city of Akron decided to do this, and they found a way to get to point A from point A to point B, and they did it without following the law. Thank you. Thank you both for your pre all of you for your presentations today. The court will take the matter under advisement. The initial written decision will be made on both sides of the court. Thank you. Thank you.